on thyroid cytology. I'm from Canberra, Australia. Uh, so the topics covered in this session is my approach uh, in thyroid cytology. How do I apply Bethesda reporting in it? Some traps and discuss a case. So let's start. So usually in my institute, uh, uh, the thyroid cytology is performed more by the radiologist. Uh, and they have a certain way of classifying the lesions. Um, we usually do not sample uh, lesions which are less than uh, uh, one centimeter uh, unless really needed. So, uh, and usually, of course, the adequacy of the sample is determined uh, by the a cyto technician on site and so uh, rapid uh, testing it, uh, is uh, done uh, and then the sample arrives to me. So that's how it happens. When it arrives to me, the quality of smear, so we usually make uh, DQ plus PAP, assess the cellularity, architecture, cytomorphology, are there any cells in the background? And always, always I correlate uh, with history and imaging. So we usually get a fantastic history. Uh, I guess so if we, uh, the most important trap is if we dissociate that sort of information, what we are seeing, we, we can be in trouble. So I have over the time learned the thyroid cytology with the help of my clinical teammates. So the aim when I'm looking at a case um, uh, is to diagnose uh, whether the sample is benign or malignant. Uh, the other way of approaching is, um, uh, uh, is it a worrying sample? Do I need uh, to warn the clinician that the lesion needs to come out? Uh, and so that's what I'm assessing. And I tend to not use any ambiguous language. Uh, uh, certain, um, the atypical category is quite, quite less in my institute because as I said, I work in close relationship with my teammates. Uh, so I, I try and exclude those sorts of terminology. So we pretty much have a benign category, malignant category, and very, very rarely I use the terminology as atypical. So uh, now I would be talking on what I'm looking at. So when I have a uh, slides or the case in front of me, I look at the architectural pattern. Flat sheets, I'm okay. Worried if it's microfollicles, if it is three-dimensional structures, if there are papillae and always look into the single cells. Um, I try and avoid the clusters which are entrapped with blood because I, we cannot assess the nuclear details uh, very nicely. When I'm looking at the cells, are they follicular cells? Um, do they have features of papillary cancer? And I would be uh, telling you all more of this in details in the coming slides. Medullary, are they spindle uh, morphology? Do they have certain, certain sorts of granules? If they look, do they look neuroendocrine? Uh, or are they absolutely malignant and something else looking at? Uh, that's another thing is um, never forget that there are many things um, uh, which could be non-thyroid coming in thyroid. So I'll always look into those aspects. Uh, in the cells, the most important feature is the shape of the cell to me. Are they round or they, are they oval? Okay, so that's one of the most important criteria I apply in thyroid cytology. Other cells, are there any inflammatory cells, hemosiderin pigments, epithelial cells, giant cells? All these are going to help me to reach a final diagnosis. So, so never forget those other cells. What's there in the background? So I 
look into the background, the most important thing, as we all know, is um, presence or absence of colloid. Who is the aspirator is the most important. So if I have a group of people whom I work in close uh, contact, uh, then I can gather more history and all. But if it comes outside this group, it, it is tricky. Um, so I look into the background, looking for colloid, blood, um, necrosis, debris, amyloid. In colloid, usually you have two types of thick and thin. Thin's better appreciated for me in pap smear, whereas thick you can appreciate more better in DQ. Um, and uh, um, various textbooks, of course, mention on, uh, uh, the appearance of colloid, like cracking, pavementing. Uh, uh, but it's sometimes very tricky, especially the thin colloid when it's like, mixed with blood. Uh, that sort of artifact is, is, is quite tricky and colloid is so... Uh, um, my criteria between benign and malignant, if as soon as I see more of colloid, I am actually less worrying for that lesion. As soon as the colloid drops um, or it's less prominent, then I am worrying. Um, and, and it all matters how is the lesion um, to the radiologist as well, who is the aspirator, because a bad aspirate can give you more blood and less colloid. And even if it is a benign benign lesion so it, it's very important so that's I mean, we, it's there in the textbook but I always have this picture in my mind so um, non-diagnostic or inadequate is very very important because you don't want to miss the lesion especially this category I you, um, you we know that it, you have to have seven to eight um good, well-visualized nuclear features and clusters um, 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 in a sample. Uh, and so if they are not there, then it, of course, goes as a non-diagnostic. If I only have colloid, then also it is a non-diagnostic because essentially I'm not visualizing any epithelial cells, follicular cells. So definitely that is important. Uh, but if the clinic, if the radiologist is trying to tell me that it is a, a, a worrying lesion for him and I'm not having enough cells, even if they are seven to eight, then I, I tend to use this category because I do not want to miss the patient completely, even if they're looking benign. I want to call them back with more cellularity. Um, so uh, that's the time I tend to use. The other time, of course, in this sort of similarly, uh, ATPI is also because both these categories, they would be called in very quickly and then uh, again, re-aspirated, re, re um, Benign and then, um, uh, which I would be talking to you in detail, and then comes the follicular category and suspicious for malignancy and malignant. So usually... Uh, we are pretty good and we call outright malignant rather than suspicious. I tend to use uh, this sort of category five only if I'm 100% that it's going to be malignant, but I don't have enough diagnostic cells. I just have a couple of cells and then uh, clusters. Uh, so a uh, few of the uh, uh, most important sample we get is um, uh, the nodular goiter. Uh, patients are usually followed up uh, to pick up PTCs and, and they are followed radiologically. So if there are sometimes a bit of worrying and odd looking calcification, then my clinical teammates um, put in a needle and then um, assess and, and the sample is sent to us. Um, so what it could be is... Um, you can have a hypoplastic looking appearance or an involuted booth. This could be a bit of a trap. You can have hurdle cell change. You can sometimes have fibrosis calcification. So it's sometimes um, very tricky in a nodular goiter, especially if it is a, uh, a clinically uh, odd looking or a worrying lesion. So what in in my benign sample, my criteria are 
epithelial cells versus colloid. So definitely I need a colloid in the background with a cracking effect. Um, uh, there should be follicular cells. So they should be flat, monolayered. Um, and in a honeycombing fashion, they all should be round and oval in shape. And there should be some single bare nuclei in the background. And the nuclei outline is quite regular. So flat sheet is important with cracking. So what do I mean by that? So if you look first in the background, there is that sort of cracking effect and, um, and the colloid thinner one is blending with a bit thicker and blood at the periphery. Uh, so that's colloid. I'm confident in that. And uh, even that's a thick colloid. Now look at the epithelial cell. So yeah, you, you start imagining a bit microfollicular pattern, but that's not the dominant pattern you have. A lot of different and odd looking area, uh, epithelial uh, clusters of the cell, uh, epithelial cells or follicular cells, they are flat. That's what we appreciate. So it is good cellularity uh, with abundant colloid in the balance and flat sheets are not basically worried more to give you emphasis on the colloid. So there are many other areas where we just have colloid and no follicular cells, but that's also okay. We just need seven to eight clusters uh, for a diagnostic sample. Um, those are the macrophages. Uh, um, uh, so that's quite often seen in a colloid nodule. So that's again a reassuring feature saying that, of course, you can see macrophages in even a malignant sample. So you have to have a minor, major criteria and a minor criteria. So for me, the flat sheets, abundant colloid are actually the major criteria. So here and there, quite often, the clusters could be very big, especially if it's a diamond aspirator, as you all can see here. It's very large and hyperplastic. If I have something like that, I always look into the cells more at the periphery, and they are still round and okay looking. Uh, and of course, there should be an abundant colloid in the background. Um, something like this, if the patient is a long-standing and um, large multinodular goiter thyroid um, and a single dominant hyperplastic nodule tend to see. Um, and we can see in cytology something like this. So um, never overcall it. You always have to look at the clinical uh, setting and, um, and the clinical background. More of PAP. So you can see again that sort of cracking and a bubbly effect and with the blood and thin is appreciated more better on um, uh, the pap smear. So you can see again flat sheets of clusters. Sometimes they look very hurdly also. But so um, if the hurdle cell population, it should be less than 10%. If it's more than 30%, then of course it's worrying and it's different cattle for fish together. So, yes, you can see an adenomatoid on a hyperplastic nodule. They tend to be very cellular. They almost can have sometimes micro, but the sheets are predominantly fat, a little bit of a 3D sort of effect, but abundant, abundant colloid in the uh, background. Uh, it could be sometimes minimal, but um, usually when it is minimal, I tend to say that it is some very difficult uh, to differentiate a hyperplastic nodule um, from the neoplasm. If it's worrying, then rebiopsy needs to be followed up in six months. Usually they settle down and then we have a better cytology so um, and we, we can assess in six months' time. Um, if the radiologist is saying that it's just colloid cyst it, and I have my teammates then and in something like that, I wouldn't be able to see any epithelial cells, um, but there would be just more abundant colloid. And I say, tend to say that it is consistent with the colloid cyst. I tend to call something a hemorrhagic colloid cyst if I see more of cholesterol clefts. Hashi, a bit tricky. <laughs> um, Usually, we do not put needle in a Hashimoto's because it's all clinically determined, but they are quite often followed regularly on radiological basis. So if it's an active Hashi, the cytology could be very cellular. 
you have a very alarming looking follicular cells and they can if you look more closely you can start imagining a bit of grooves and inclusions but if you look closely there are lymphocytes um and not only in the background but also they try and attack those um follicular cells and that's like an autoimmune sort of process which we quite often see um uh, the herdel cells also can be very very alarming and all these is more active and so we have told our clinicians that in that to um hashi it is very difficult um, to pick up any papillary lesions uh, or a herdel cell lesion so uh, they are aware of that and that's of course an important trap um so usually it's a mixed population like plasma cells immunoblast tangible body macrophages we see but one has to be aware that in hashi um uh, we can have lymphomas happening so if you have a monotonous appearing population if it's a sudden enlarging hashi then also one needs to um uh, no um uh, uh we are one needs to consider lymphomas and then we send the sample for flow cytometry so uh if it's an active one you tend to see the germinal centers um uh, uh on the smear uh, and always back of the mind the cytology is sent to us to exclude epithelial or lymphoid malignancy so they always look very very blue and cellular like that so it's a fantastic aspirate as you all can see lots of cells uh, you have to hunt for those epithelial cells as you can see here they are follicular cells and lot of cells in the background and if you look more closely i always look at the company of recognizable cells so you have a small tiny lymphocytes and a bigger larger one which are even blast but if i have a combination of both, i'm relatively assured that it's a, uh, a relatively benign sample so more always remember of the air drawing artifact and the active hashi can have only scanned colloid in the background the most important clue for me is this sort of autoimmune process where you tend to have the inflammatory cells infiltrating the epithelial islands something like this um hashi in kids is always worrying and one has to remember because it could be quite alarming and um, uh the imaging is very important whether there are enlarged lymph nodes and all and if that is um with an enlargement of a thyroid one has to think of a papillary carcinoma as well um and that's why i said that cytology in dissociation reporting dissociated with the imaging and the clinical finding is sometimes very tricky and that's the biggest trap I, i i find if i don't have the clinical inputs they can have that sort of herdely and very alarming cells and they tend to not look very circular or oval um around in shape but they become elongated so it can be worrying and again if it's an active hashi and it's a worrying lesion i say that a small ptc cannot be completely excluded um, telling that yes i can completely miss it so that's about more of a benign category and we come into the follicular neoplasm so the aspirin if it's done by a good one we can have moderate to abundant colloid but in this particular one you start seeing uh 3d's and macrofollicular pattern um and so it, it is quite challenging uh, to differentiate between both the things especially if it is a large lesion like more than 3 cm i am always worried especially a dominant lesion so um so how is the cytology yes they can be sensational but they become 3d's microfollicular pattern becomes um, more um, um, prominent uh, you can uh, the nuclei instead of monolayered becomes overlapping they still tend to be smooth and a granular chromatin and they don't have any papillary features um and the background is minimal to less so that's how the colloid drops and the cellularity increases uh and that's how to me the 
to look into the background is the most important and essential feature uh, to reach a diagnosis. Uh, you can clearly see here uh, at the bottom there is a microfollicular pattern at the top. Um, it's 3D. It looks you can appreciate better on a microscope where when you move your focal. Um, um, uh, it, the, there are more than three or four layers. You can easily count them and you can see them. There is a significant overlapping in three dimensional features. When you look into the nuclei, they are still round in shape more uh, like that's almost looking like a hypoplastic one. But when we look away from this sort of hypoplastic fragment, there are more microfollicular um, groups which are formed and some are macrofollicular. So uh, it, it, uh, it should be single layer, like a form, forming like a small flowery structure uh, uh, seen uh, across the smear. And yes, um, one needs to identify that very, very scant or almost no colloid in the background. So dropping of colloid, um, coming up of this predominant microfollicular pattern and the variability in the nuclei, some are big and some are small, that also starts coming in. More that sort of all these microfollicles are attached to form a structure, but